Good morning or good afternoon, everybody, depending on where you are in the country today. And welcome to Researcher on Call, an interactive series hosted by the Canadian Health Services Research Foundation, which is intended to bring together policymakers, healthcare executives, researchers, and the public to participate in a series of dialogues about how we can improve health services for Canadians. Uh, the Promoting Policy Dialogue at CHSRF really helps uh, to inform policymaking in Canada to improve health care and the health of all Canadians by really developing evidence-informed options for health system financing, quality, and performance, and by facilitating dialogue like we're doing today to stimulate ideas and action. Our work really focuses on commissioning policy-relevant research, convening stakeholders to stimulate ideas and action, and ultimately change, developing mechanisms to exchange knowledge and spread innovative health reform options and recommendations, and facilitate change management processes to improve health care in Canada. So that's a little bit about what we're going to do, what we're trying to do, and really the purpose of these kinds of calls. Uh, it's my pleasure now to turn things over to Jillian Mulville, who's our Director of Healthcare Financing, Innovation, and Transformation here at CHSRF. Jillian's going to facilitate this call, and Jillian, over to you. Thank you very much, Stephen, and thank you to everyone for joining us today. We're going to be discussing innovation and pharmaceutical spending. Spending on, on pharmaceuticals is a fast-growing component of overall healthcare spending in Canada. The key question we want to address today is, how can we manage drug spending while encouraging innovation in pharmaceutical technologies? On February 18th, a small group of invited stakeholders met to discuss policy options for managing brand name and generic drug pricing while encouraging innovation. Today's researcher on call will expand the discussion to include policymakers, stakeholders, researchers, and citizens across the country. Joining us today are Paul Grutendorst, Associate Professor in the Faculty of Pharmacy and Director of the Division of Clinical, Social, and Administrative Pharmacy at the University of Toronto, and Bob Nakagawa, Assistant Deputy Minister of Pharmaceutical Services in the Ministry of Health Services in British Columbia. On the line today, we have over 80 organizations registered with representation from across the country. Today's call begins with a joint presentation from both Paul and Bob, and then we will open the lines for a question and answer period where I'll take questions from you, our audience. Instructions for asking, asking questions will be given at that time. Now, let's get on with it. We'd love to hear, and I'll hand the floor over to Paul and Bob. Thank you. Thanks for the kind introduction, Jillian, and hello, Canada. It's uh, useful to begin by <coughs> the presentation by asking, what are the social objectives that our pharmaceutical policy is trying to achieve? In other words, where do we want to go? Well, I believe that there are uh, three objectives at play here. First, we want to reward the development of clinically useful new drugs, as these can be very valuable, and Canada can easily afford to, to do so as a rich country. The second objective, I think, is that we want to ensure that some of this drug development takes place within our borders. We want to have some local R&D taking place here. The, the third objective, I think, is that we want to ensure that drug costs are affordable for individual Canadians, especially those without um, adequate insurance coverage, and we also want to ensure that drug plan costs are sustainable. Bob, what are your thoughts? Well, thanks, Paul. Um, first off, uh, I don't know if folks noticed the, the first slide, uh, opening slide that Paul had put with the title on it, but um, it's interesting because uh, if folks have it now. Um, well, actually, you've got mine. So uh, Paul's slide said, policy options to manage drug spending and support pharmaceutical innovation. And you know, as we get into this, it almost implies that uh, the notion of, of uh, managing drug spending and, and uh, supporting innovation are somehow mutually exclusive, and I don't think they are. Um, but I do have a bit of a different take on it, and so my title um, is a little bit different in saying that rather than the, the surrogate of uh, pharmaceutical innovation in itself as being the end point, um, what I'm really interested in is uh, having policy options to manage uh, the drug spending and the drug cost 
um, through improved pharmaceutical outcomes. And I think ultimately, at least, and I'd like to hear, Paul, if, if you do agree, but um, the innovation in itself isn't, the, isn't what we're after. What we're after is, is better outcomes for, for Canadians. So, uh, now, Paul, did you want to respond to that before I go to my next slide? Or? Um, <clears throat> no, I agree. The, en the entire point of the game is to um, improve people's health. That's why we're doing innovation. We want to reward the development of clinically useful new drugs. That's the overarching objective, or one of the overarching objectives. Great. So, so you know, I think it's important just to remember that, that innovation is really a, a bit of a surrogate, and, and like all surrogates, we need to validate that, that modeling. Certainly. So, so let's go to the next slide. Okay. Um, so um, Paul had, had identified uh, what the social objectives were, were from his perspective, and so I've, um, I've, I've taken a, my take at it, and, and certainly we want to make sure that we have uh, uh, ther safe and therapeutically useful drugs, and, and I would agree that drugs are extremely valuable to society. I, I'm a pharmacist as well, so um, inherently I believe that, that they're um, extremely useful for, for improving the, the health of Canadians. Um, in terms of the drug funding, um, you know, the way I look at it, 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 it's really an investment that governments uh, put in, in, into the health of, of Canadians. So we want to make sure that there's a, a good investment and we get that, that appropriate uh, return on, on, on the investment. Um, Paul had identified that uh, you know, he wanted to see that some of this R&D takes place in Canada. And I think that's great. I mean, it would be wonderful at, at all levels of the, the um, life cycle of drugs if we were able to, to stimulate um, investment in, in Canadian jobs. And you know, as, as a British Columbian, I'd like to see some of that uh, come, in, come into our province and, and recognizing that there's a, there's a significant investment in, in points um, east of here. The question that, that I have when we talk about how much of the, that R&D um, takes place and, and where it takes place is, you know, what level is actually appropriate? Um, we you know, are reminded constantly that we're a relatively small country in, in the scheme of things and in pharmaceutical uh, utilization. Um, so how much of it can we reasonably expect to, to uh, come into Canada and then within our, our, our country, um, how can we coordinate the, those, those efforts? So there needs to be some sort of a worldwide uh, mechanism and, and I'm not aware of, of that body yet. So it's something that we might be, be uh, interested in looking at is to uh, setting something up with, with other parts of, of the world. And as I alluded to, the, the type of research, whether that, that's bench or animal or, or um, sort of clinical trials are, are really uh, good for um, us to be involved with because it gives our clinicians a bit of a, um, a taste for things and it, it gives them some tools of uh, entities that they can use where, where other drugs have not been um, uh, effective in individual patients. Um, and then, as said, the, the regional distribution is, is important for me. So um, back to you, Paul. Okay. Well, <clears throat> thanks, Bob. Um, so I described earlier what my take on the social objectives um, are. The, the question that follows is how can we actually get there? What are the different policy options we can pursue as a country to, to realize those objectives? And I, I think there are three. Uh, the first is to subsidize the cost of drug R&D directly. So in particular, we can increase public subsidies for basic research, uh, translational research, which attempts to identify promising drug candidates, as well as subsidizing the cost of clinical trials, which are <coughs> a very costly component of the total drug R&D process. The second option is to reward the outputs of the drug discovery process. That is, we can reward new drugs. Now, if we want to do so, we have two basic choices. We can do what we currently do, more or less, which is paying high prices for new drugs. If we can go further, we could implement the EU proposals for stronger pharmaceutical intellectual property protection. That's another option. Or we can uh, reward the outputs of drug R&D by implementing a um, reward system based on measured health impacts, where the more health outcome you produce, or the more measured health outcome you produce, the bigger is reward. And the third option is to 
is to use those previous two com um, options in some combination. So we could, you know, we could, for instance, maximize the uh, pay really high prices for new drugs and minimize drug subsidies, or we could maximize drug subsidies and minimize the prices paid for new drugs, or we could do something in between. Um, so those are what um, my, my co-investigator, Aidan Hollis, and I identified as being in sort of the broad brush strokes to different policy op op options available to us. Bob, comments? Um, well, I think that that's great, and, and um, so what I've done is t provided my take of, of those policy options, and if we look at, at things like subsidizing drug R&D directly, it's one of the things we have to just think about is, is how much um, you know, government should be involved in, in directly funding these things. And you know, there's certainly going to be a continuum of, of sort of a, a little bit of funding that, that may not be enough to, to complete funding of, of the, uh, the discovery stuff. And, and, you know, maybe somewhere along that continuum uh, we will find the right place uh, for, for Canadians. One of the things that would really make it a lot easier for us to, to think about those things is, is if we're able to, um, as we're investing money in, in the development of new pharmaceuticals, ensure that there's better alignment uh, with the needs of, of the therapeutic needs of, of patients and uh, uh, for tools for clinicians to be able to, to use when they're, they're faced with these difficult clinical situations. Um, and, and I think it would be easier for uh, governments to, to support the development of those, those products. That being said, I think, you know, the commercial environment that we have right now uh, does uh, uh, have, we do have an opportunity to do the same thing. Um, to to have conversations between uh, payers and and uh, and drug developers and producers uh, to create that that alignment. One of the things we might uh, think about in terms of uh, if we're supporting that R R and D uh, directly is is you know while drugs are in those those trials um, you know they, they they could be provided free of charge to those patients who require them. Um, and that would help to offset some of our expenses. Um, and maybe, you know, if we start a patient on, on the drug during a trial period and they find that it actually is effective, that they're able to continue on with it as part of the funding that, that government might be providing um, for, the, uh, for, the, for the product development. Um, and coming back to my, my thought of, of um, um, investments, and the uh, investments in new drugs. We're, we're looking at, at returns on investment and, and how do we minimize the risk. So again, if we look at the ability to align the, uh, the development of new drugs with the, the needs, the clinical needs of, of our society, then I think we minimize the risks, uh, the investment risks for, for our taxpayers. Um, it's interesting when we say we want, you know, one of the options is to pay high prices for new drugs. And, you know, nobody really wants to hear that we're going to pay a high price. I think we want to hear that we're paying the right price or an ap appropriate price. Um, and I think, you know, we've in Canada come to a point where we're paying, we're paying an appropriate price as, as we, we felt uh, uh, fit uh, for the drugs that, that we, we have. And, and we have various mechanisms to determine whether that price is, is right for us. Um, and, and have been doing so for, for a long time. And we're looking for that, that value for money. And it's harder with if we have um, a therapeutic class where there's already a, you know, a number of, of products available. We're continually looking to say, um, well, can we make that drug available because it's expensive? Uh, can we make it available only to those patients who could truly benefit from it? Um, and, and limit it some way. And for manufacturers, that's, that's not great because it, it, it does limit their market. Um, but, you know, we've got to find that balance between the, the relative price of the drug and, and the value that, that we're able to, to get in meeting society's needs. Um, and, of course, you know, nobody's got lots of money these days, and, and governments are sure, uh, certainly uh, feeling the, the, the crunch of the, the recession and, and all the economic pressures on us. So we, we do have limits to, to how far we can go, and, and um, it's no different than any other uh, group that's funded by government. Uh, but I agree with you, Paul, that, that if we can uh, do some combination of those two and, and perhaps other things, and, then, uh, and we'll achieve those things by, by working together and, and, and talking more about what, what the possibilities are. Um, so I'll turn it back to you. Okay. Thanks, Bob. All right. So 
In my previous slides, I talked about the objectives. Um, we talked about the policy options. The next question, of course, is which is the best policy option? Of all the different options we have available to us on, a, on the menu, which one should we pursue? Well, I would submit to you that the answer is, is that we don't know. We simply don't know what is the best vehicle to get to the uh, objectives. That's why we argue in the, um, the paper that accompanies this call that you can download from the CHSRF website is, <clears throat> well, it could be self-serving because we're, it calls for more research, <laughs> and that's my business. Um, but I, I, what I think we need to do is, is have some enumeration of, first of all, how much we currently spend um, across all levels of support uh, for drug R&D. Then we have to ask ourselves the question, we're a rich country, what is an appropriate amount that we should be spending in support of drug R&D? I think we should not be shirking our responsibility internationally to uh, pull our, carry our weight in this regard. And <clears throat> the third uh, question that we need to assess, or the third point, would be what form this support should take. What combination of subsidies of R&D costs or rewards for new drugs or combinations thereof should we pursue in support of the policy objectives. Bob, comments? Um, I, I'd agree that, that we really don't know what the best policy option is, and, and I guess that's not a mission of, of failure as much as, as saying that, you know, things evolve and, and we need to, to find a path forward. Uh, but we need to assess, too, what, what's our, what is the, the ultimate goal for, for Canada? Uh, you know, so if we're asking ourselves, do we spend enough in support of, of drug and R&D, I don't know. Uh, may, maybe we could spend more. Um, maybe we could spend less. Um, I, I don't quite know what, what the metric would be. At different points in time, there's been numbers thrown out there, and, and uh, the Patent Medicine Prices Review Board had a, uh, a number that was, uh, I guess, agreed upon in, in, in legislation um, to, to establish a level, and, and my understanding is that level hasn't been, been um, uh, met um, and by the, the manufacturers of the products. But you know the the question is how much is appropriate from manufacturers, how much is appropriate from from governments, and I guess even from within the government world is is, is this uh, uh, to be funded through through uh, uh, federal government uh, investment in research, and maybe the the uh, paying the the higher prices you call it Paul um, would be be funded through the the provincial side as we as we do now. So there's a lot of things there, and 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 then coming back to the point of as as global players, what so what is the percentage of the world market that we should be be funding, and are there particular products that we should be uh, funding to a greater degree because they're perhaps of greater interest to Canadians, um, or is this something that we're looking at the world stage of of, of uh, drug needs in order to to move forward? Um, then again, you know, with the lack of uh, a single body that's actually charged with, with doing this, um, you know, we, we probably have to look at some sort of an infrastructure to do this uh, both worldwide um, and in Canada. In terms of rewarding the, the outputs of the R&D, we talked about the high prices. And I think we, we do invest a, a lot of money through the prices that we pay and the prices that, that uh, uh, consumers pay um, right now. Um, so I think that, that some of that is there. And uh, if we, the ideally, we'd be able to, to pay for uh, drugs uh, relative to, to their measured health impact. And I guess what I'm getting at is that we know that uh, innovation in itself um, can put a whole bunch of uh, new products out there. Some of them are going to be wonderful blockbuster breakthroughs, um, and some of them are not. And I guess what would be uh, worthwhile pursuing is, is a system where the, the, um, the, the drugs that advance health in a in, uh, population that has unmet needs or that, uh, um, you know, there's, there's an alignment with uh, a direction from, from, from a society, um, that they're rewarded more uh, than those that, that uh, don't meet those, uh, those criteria. So back to you, Paul. Okay, so let's just review one of the policy options which um, 
<coughs> is, is frequently um, cited as being the best possible uh, policy option, that's paying high prices for new drugs. Is this, will this get us to where we want to go? Will this achieve our social objectives? Well, to my mind, this, the, the, the verdict is still out on this question. And the reason I say this is that there's evidence that paying high drug prices, although it's one feasible way, is a very costly way to support drug innovation. Um, and here's why. We know that the industry, the pharmaceutical industry, allocates roughly 50% of sales revenues um, to drug um, R&D. And we also know that it now costs $1.8 billion to bring a new drug to market. And these are all figures that um, have come from industry. It follows from those two previous figures that <clears throat> we need $12 billion in sales revenues to support the development of a new drug. That, to me, seems to be a pretty expensive way of proceeding. Um, and that would, if I was, you know, looking at a menu of policy options, that would certainly get me to think about, you know, the uh, efficacy of other options. Um, and, uh, you know, changing the mix of policy support. So, for instance, what we could do is, as least as, you know, at least consider that, not just we pursue this, but consider it, is paying lower prices for new drugs, and we identify s some ways of doing that in the paper, using, for instance, bulk purchasing or eliminating the most favored nation policies used in Manitoba and elsewhere, um, some limited, more, more but limited use of reference pricing in some cases, and use the savings to enhance um, support for drug R&D in ways that will enhance the productivity of the drug R&D sector. So that's what we suggest uh, takes place, is to consider, sober, have a sober look at all the possible policy options. Bob, back to you. Um, sure. So maybe first off, I just to, to respond a little bit to some of the points. I think that um, you know what I haven't seen and would be interesting is is to do the math a little bit uh, further, um, recognizing the sort of the percentage of the uh, global um, uh, pharmaceutical market, um, if not population, that uh, Canada represents, and then then figuring it out based on the, you know the you know how many drugs in a year and. And we can take either the the 1.8 billion dollars, or or I've seen numbers substantially less than that. But whatever numbers that we can land on, uh, figure out the math and, and you know what is our, our fair share, and and uh, are we currently contributing that, and, and do we you know or do we need to increase or, or reduce it to, to meet that? Um, the notion of um, sort of implementing things like like bulk purchasing, uh, which we we've we've talked about a number of times, um, the elimination of most favored nation uh, clauses, uh, re reference pricing, those sorts of things, um, and th them generating savings, which then could be um, be uh, uh, redirected into into um, uh, research is, is good. The only problem with it is that uh, you know these are are monies that that. Uh, uh, we often need just to live within our budget, so there's not like there's a pot of money that then would be available. Um, so that's you know a bit of a response to some of those that that the money um, uh, still has to be available within within the budget, and sometimes we don't have that room. Um, but some other considerations that that I had in terms of uh, uh, this topic is 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 we're talking about governments actually getting more involved in the pharmaceutical game, and, and I think many people would argue that we're, we're perhaps too involved already. Um, but the question I have is, you know, how much do marketplaces stimulate innovation, and, and is it do, how much freedom does the market need, place need to, to, to be able to do that? And in, in our world, uh, I guess the, the, the factor that, that um, complicates things a lot is that the, the, the largest um, uh, payers in the marketplace are, are, are typically the, the provinces, uh, uh, the, the public payers. Um, and if we're going to stimulate innovation, do we do it by putting targeted money in, or do we do it by, by funding the drugs that have the most significant impact? and either funding less or, or not funding those drugs that don't have uh, a large impact uh, on, on patient outcomes. Um, so, you know, it's trying to find, you know, what the role of, of players are in, in the marketplace. 
Um, and then, you know, again, we tend to, to look at our own little part of the world, and, and, and we do have to look at what those, those, those world health needs are. And, and we are a very rich country, as you, you mentioned earlier, Paul. And we, we are very privileged. Um, even in the types of diseases that we decide to uh, target our drugs at, um, compared to uh, you know the third world countries and the world stage overall. Uh, that being said, I thought well you know maybe we should take a look at what what is uh, what are the opportunities worldwide and and you know actually start to to pull together some uh, some folks to to talk about about it. Now I'm trying to advance my slide and it doesn't seem to be going. There we go. Uh, the, <laughs> the animated slides don't work that well. So what I did is is um, I just typed in pharmaceutical policy improved outcomes options um, into into our friend Google, and uh, there's a number of of scholarly articles and and uh, papers that that come up when people search for this. Um, so the if you, if you you take a look, then actually there's a, some Canadian work in pharmaceutical policy, and and uh, Paul, I know that you were involved with with some of this. And it does look at, at, at you know, what we can do in looking at cost controls, uh, pharmaceutical cost containment in, in other parts of the world, and, and trying to, to uh, benefit from, from their experiences and, and uh, I guess, not necessarily importing those experience di experiences directly into, into Canada, uh, but perhaps uh, learning from, from where they are and, uh, and um, developing a, a, a method that works well for, for Canada. And I think it's something that we haven't done very much of. And uh, I would certainly encourage uh, uh, the more international dialogue, because the, the problems that, that we're facing, the challenges, um, really aren't that much different um, here than, than elsewhere in, in the world. Um, so I think I'm going to try to this. Okay, this, yeah, the animation is just too slow, so I got it ahead of that. So I'm going to turn it back over to you, Paul. Okay, well, <clears throat> I'd like to, in my last slide here, just to present some more options available to consider. Um, I'd like to show you an article that now appears on your screen, which was recently published in Nature, and is titled, Traditional Drug Discovery Model Ripe for Reform. It speaks about these new collaborative models of drug discovery that uh, hold the uh, promise to, I think, significantly enhance the productivity of drug R&D. And the idea here is <clears throat> that academic and industrial scientists would join forces to design drugs that have a reasonable chance of clearing the formidable clinical trial hurdles. I mean, what would, the idea here is that these combining the industrial knowledge base with the academic um, expertise to get a better understanding of human pathophysiology and pharmacology to design better drugs that actually could work in clinical trials and have a better chance of um, actually making it to the clinic. And that's probably the, one of the biggest hurdles that is facing the drug discovery enterprise right now is uh, the high rate of attrition as drugs wander their way through the you know tortuous clinical trial process. So in closing, this is a, a policy consideration that I, I think uh, needs to be looked at closely. Jillian, back to you. From our participants, and I'd just like to go over the two ways that you can pose a question. First, to ask your question verbally press star 1 on your touchtone telephone. If you wish to answer your quest, ask your question electronically, please use the questions box located on your control panel as illustrated on the slide. We ask you, when asking a question, please identify to whom the question is being addressed, and please try to ask only one question at a time. Okay, we have our first question has come in electronically, so I'll just read that out to you now. And it's addressed to Bob. The provinces and private insurers pay for very different sets of drugs. Typically, private insurers are comprehensive and indiscriminate in their formularies. Arguably, this distorts the incentives of companies to innovate, since they can make money even from drugs that offer very little therapeutic value. 
is there a need for provinces and private insurers to coordinate better? Then maybe we could pay less in total and support innovation better. Bob? It's an interesting thought, um, and I, I certainly would, would support um, uh, more dialogue and uh, between uh, the public and the, and the private payers, um, and they, they have certainly come to us at different points in time uh, because we you know they don't have capacity for for various types of programs that we have have offered and they tend to not do the same sorts of, of reviews as we do so I I would certainly support that um, that dialogue at least in terms of us requiring them to do something um, I think that becomes a very difficult uh, political thing to do um, but if if they were to uh, uh, want to cooperate, or if they chose to to align with uh, the provincial um, uh, drug list within the you know the jurisdictions that they're working in, um, then then certainly that would be be their decision. But I wouldn't see that as being a, a government um, initiative to to require them to to uh, align with us. It might be something that they do on their own. I don't know if we've got any other uh, questions coming in, but Paul, oh, I was my apologies, Bob. Uh, I was on mute, so <laughs> let me give you the next question. Uh, this one is uh, starts regarding and in quotes rewarding drugs based on their health impact. Unquote. When could you imagine determining the amount of the reward? Would you suggest prospectively measuring health impacts to determine appropriate level of subsidy at the time of market authorization or public reimbursement? Or would trial results be sufficient to determine the level of the initial reward? And would the level of subsidy change over time to increase or decrease depending on the actual health impact observed? Are you suggesting evaluating health impact at different points on an ongoing basis to inform what the level of reward should be over time? Bob. Uh, interesting question, and certainly one that that uh, you know takes a fair bit of thought. Uh, my my initial reaction is uh, yes, that we, we would need to do it at at different points in time uh, that correlate with the the degree of knowledge that we have about the drug and the therapeutic need. Uh, so there might be a, a, a an early point in time um, at at market access, market authorization, based on the the information and and perhaps the 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 value that we expect to get. Um, and, and depending on, on you know, the therapeutics, um, it would determine how long after that uh, we're able to do a, a reassessment based, based on both the uh, therapeutic effectiveness as well as the safety issues. Um, because as folks know that the real world experience in this area will, will be much more telling than the, uh, the, the uh, experience in the, in the clinical trials. Um, so I, you know, I haven't seen a model in, uh, that, that I know works well. Um, so this would be developing something quite new and quite innovative. But I would expect that we would do it perhaps at, at, a, at a few checkpoints um, and, and make those adjustments um, as, as we move forward. And they might be through you know, either, either increases uh, to reward the value that's been achieved um, or reductions or, or formulary restrictions uh, based on, on the knowledge that's been accrued. But the challenge, of course, is that we'd actually have to do those measures, um, which are, are much easier said than done. Okay. Well, if I, could, <clears throat> if I could jump in, um, it, it turns out that my colleague, uh, Aidan Paulus from the University of Calgary, his, his colleague, uh, Thomas Pogue from Yale University, have, in fact, proposed a a scheme, a system by which <clears throat> you could actually operationalize the concept of pay for performance or base um, payment based on actual health outcome. And they've called it the health impact fund. If you Google that term health impact fund, you'll get uh, a link to their proposal. But briefly, what would happen is um, this would be an optional scheme in which uh, a drug manufacturer could elect to um, relinquish their patent privilege and then if they do so, they would be required to sell the drug worldwide at a price close to average cost of production. Um, and in exchange for selling at low prices 
Following market approval, the, the firm would receive 10 annual payments based on the measured health impact. So um, there would actually have to be some measurement taken to see both the volume of use and the, the benefit conferred by that use. So you can imagine some drugs like um, Ramipril, which initially had a limited indication, would presumably get pay payments that increased over time, if, should Ramipril be part of that scheme, because its indications increased following this, the release of the HOPE study. Another drug, let's say Vioxx, would, be, would have <coughs> a reduction of payments because it was obviously withdrawn from the market after only a few years on the market. So, you know, that there are proposals out there. None have been implemented, but um, there is work underway to consider uh, pilots of these schemes. I think it's generating a lot of interest. Um, and we hope to um, pilot one of these, or my colleagues hope to pilot one of these within the next five years, I hope. Great. Thank you both. Um, at this time, I'd just like to check with the operator. Are there any questions on the line at this time? Yes, our first question comes from the line of Tanya DuPont from Health Canada. Please go ahead. Perhaps your line is muted. We have no further questions at this time. Please continue. Okay. Uh, back to the electronic questions. Uh, one of the presenters, and I believe it was you, Paul, mentioned that it cost $1.2 billion to develop a new drug. Where does this figure come from? Can you explain it? The actual number was $1.8 billion, um, and I believe that came from the art, the reference to that article is was given in the slides. Uh, it was from an article that came out last year in Nature Reviews Drug Discovery by um, Paul et al., and it looked at the most recent evidence on uh, failure rates of drugs at various stages of the clinical trial process, uh, trial size, cost of enrolling uh, subjects in the trials. I think it was based largely upon the DeMossi framework, which is more or less accepted in, in these circles, um, and they simply tweak the numbers to reflect the most current reality. Okay, thank you. Um, next question. Paul, should governments not be included in the loop when manufacturers are developing drugs since they are primary payers? Your thoughts? Um, well, they, they are. I mean, the answer is yes. I mean, presumably uh, drug developers look at their market <laughs> when, when they decide what drugs they want to um, advance through the clinical trial process and development process. And uh, because one of the biggest payers in, in Canada and elsewhere are governments, they certainly look at governments' willingness to pay for different types of therapies. And um, whether or not that could be, you know, the, whether, whether or not the governments might get involved at an earlier stage uh, depends on the kind of scheme you have proposed. I mean, there's some, there's currently some work, as I discussed in the last slide I presented, there's these consortium, which are currently underway, which would involve academic stakeholder academics and industrial scientists working together, and there'd be money provided from uh, governments and from the industry. You know, in that case, the question is a bit more subtle because that what you know, given that the government's footing part of the bill of the cost of the drug R and D, what kind of say should they have in terms of what drugs get developed? Um, that's a really interesting question that is currently being addressed, hopefully, with our CHR grant gets funded, which would look at that exact question in the context of this, um, this open source uh, collaboration model, which I described briefly. Yeah, I guess my, my um, take of the question is it is responding to a bit to your, your last slide where it talks about the academic researchers uh, playing a much uh, greater role. And um, rather than the, the payers or the governments being involved in, in just, you know, having input just through the drugs that they fund, um, maybe get a, a bit ahead of that so that, that uh, manufacturers aren't funding at that late point in time mm -hmm. uh, where they're, you know, uh, governments are interested in funding it, but at an earlier point so that they don't uh, put their whatever $1.8 billion into a drug that, that payers aren't interested in paying for. Okay, great. Thank you both. Um, I, again, I'd like to turn to the operator for a moment. And could you please just remind people how they can place a verbal question? And are there any questions at this time? 
Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, if there are any additional questions at this time, please press the star followed by the one. As a reminder, if you're using a speakerphone, please lift the handset before pressing any keys. Our next question comes from the line of John Elliott from Sanofi Aventis. Please go ahead. Hi. Uh, just a comment uh, slash uh, asking for your um, uh, reaction. Um, there's been a focus, I think, in health policy uh, and certainly amongst provincial drug plans to reimburse uh, primarily breakthrough innovations. But much of um, progress in, in medicine is really done through incremental innovation, and that's true for all technology, really. If you look at uh, whether it be uh, you know, Moore's Law and the progress of uh, microchips over the past 50 years or hard drive um, creation or even the BlackBerry, if you look at that from 1999 to now, all of it comes in increments. Do you have any recommendations from a policy perspective on how we can recognize incremental innovation? Paul, did you want to start or do you want me to start? Or? Uh, what, well, you're the uh, payer, Bob, so why don't you start? Uh, I can jump in after you finish. Sure. Uh, yeah, it's hard to, to respond um, to sort of these um, um, bit of a hypothetical construct, but I understand what you're saying, that, that there's that the the a lot of the drugs um, you know may be a, a little bit better, but w what we found, I think my observation at least, is that um, many times uh, what we find with these drugs is that they're they're better in a, in a subpopulation of patients rather than sort of uh, making a, having a breakthrough uh, in a particular therapy. So if they're they're of value in patients who have failed on the traditional therapies, or in those patients who have a particular parameter, like they've got renal failure or compromised renal function, or they, they you know they 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 ha they can't tolerate for whatever reason the the um, the gold standards. Um, so in those cases, from a from a value for money perspective. Uh, payers are saying, well, okay, if it costs the same amount of money or if it costs more, then how can I make sure that I get the value from that additional amount um, and, and not um, have the risk of that additional uh, expense uh, being um, applied across the whole patient population that's being uh, in that therapeutic area? Uh, so that uh, the, the costs end up just going up for everybody, even though only a, a percentage of them may actually need that over other agents. So I guess part of the challenge for us in this area is that does the, is the incrementalism associated at the same time with, with an increase in the amount that's spent. In other commodity areas, like you know, you reference Moore's law. Um, what we found is that that uh, you get that that uh, incrementalism, or actually, that's saying that you know the computing power would actually double. Um, but at the same time, we see a, a reduction in the price. Um, so it's a little bit of a different driver uh, in a different situation than what we're seeing in the pharmaceutical market. Okay. Are you finished there, Bob? Or I, sure? I'm done. Sorry. Okay. Well, I mean, <clears throat> my sense of this is that, you know, the payers are, <laughs> they're facing pretty bonding constraints in their budgets. They have to, you know, I think, I'm, I'm sure that Bob's had to go back to the finance department to ask for more money for his uh, budget. So they're very, you know, uh, increasingly they're price conscious and um, maybe they're a little bit too price conscious. Maybe they're not s supporting innovation you know, incremental innovation appropriately. Maybe that you know, when a drug comes out in a once-a-day formulation as opposed to twice a day, maybe we should be more generous with that. On the other hand, uh, I mean, I can see the point when they say they look at a drug, um, not to be too specific here, but let's say we look at the drug Nexium, which uh, was a a variant of the drug Losec. You know, I can see the point. Um, I didn't see an overwhelming clinical case to be made for the funding of Nexium, and that would be an incremental innovation. Um, so if you're a funder, you're looking at, do I pay the patented price for Nexium, or do I get the generic version of LOSAC? Mm. Uh, I don't think there's enough value in, the, in that for me to go with Nexium, so I'll stick with the LOSAC. I, mean, I can understand where the payers are coming from, given their constraints. Yeah, it's sort of like, you know, for us, is we're spending taxpayers' money, so does it make sense for us to spend more for really the same outcome. Um, and being able to justify that when, when folks say, well, you know, because for us, the, the costs end up, you know, uh, 
um, compounding so that or, or being you know that much more because of the populations that we're serving. So y these little changes in prices seem to all always add up to millions of dollars for us. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. That was a very stimulating discussion. Um, next question. Bob, you mentioned that innovative drugs addressing unmet needs is the best case scenario Sh and it should, is what should be primarily funded as compared to other conventional non-innovative drugs. However, a cro closer look at reimbursement rates of drugs for orphan or rare diseases by the Canadian Agency for Drugs and Technology and Health, CADIS, is less than 10%. Is there a disconnect between the mandates of the provinces and that of the HTA recommendations? Your thoughts? Mm, I don't know. It's hard because uh, I have to look at what those specifics are. I know the the um, orphan drugs for for rare diseases are they're very different. Um, uh, sort of situation than most of the drugs that we're talking about, uh, because in those cases, um, you know, normally we we have our, our our standards set for for the the drugs that we would evaluate and and the the uh, types of reviews that are undertaken, and they, you know they require statistical and clinical significance and 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 the numbers that are needed to to uh, provide those are often uh, the numbers of patients are are huge. Um, and much greater than the number of patients who actually have these rare diseases. So it makes it a, a challenge methodologically to, to uh, meet those tests. The other difference is, is that uh, uh, some of these drugs, and I think that these are the ones that are being spoken of, are, are extremely expensive. Um, so, you know, they're not in the same order of magnitude of expense, um, so it becomes a, a, a challenge as well uh, when you're talking about drugs that can be in the, the hundreds of thousands of dollars per patient per year um, versus, you know, most uh, garden variety drugs for, for high blood pressure and, and so on are, you know, you're talking about, say, you know, thirty, forty dollars a month sort of thing. So they're, they're quite a different situation, so it's hard to, to sort of respond to uh, a perceived disconnect when really they're, they're such a different situation that, that we do struggle with, with how to, how to deal with those within our limits. Okay. Um, in your presentation and paper, you don't seem to address the issue of the indirect subsidies to drug development via the very generous R&D tax credit regime in Canada and its potential and or pros and cons to address the policy challenges being addressed. Overall, R&D tax credits in Canada are recognized as being one of the most generous set of life science R&D supports in the developed world. Can you comment on that? I think that's the Paul question. Uh, <laughs> no, I wasn't suggesting that there's no um, uh, there was no sub existing public subsidy of the cost of the R&D itself. All I was suggesting is that we sit down and enumerate these and then identify if this is in keeping, if the total support provided, either through high, higher than competitive prices or drug supports, if this is in keeping with a country as wealthy as we are. Um, on the very issue of subsidies, um, I do know that this, <coughs> there are some irritants um, that the industry, the brand industry, um, um, has taken some issue with the, the way in which the rules are implemented. So it's not perhaps quite as generous as you might think um, in the operation of the program. It's um, difficult to claim credits in some instances. Um, if you speak with my uh, colleague, Mark Ferdinand at RxMD can provide you some more fulsome explanation, but it's not perhaps as generous uh, a program as you might think. Okay, thanks. Bob, a question for you. In other countries, notably those in the EU, uh, they've defined, redefined value when it evaluates drugs and takes into account other parameters beyond direct health outcomes. Shouldn't Canada and Canadian provinces be moving towards this type of assessment since not all innovation goes beyond uh, an improvement in health outcomes. Different delivery systems allowing the patient to be more independent, for example, may be important. Um, sure. Um, I, I would actually argue that uh, um, you know the ability of a patient to be more independent and their sort of the uh, to deal cope with the, the activities of daily living um, should be parameters that are included in a, in a pharmacoeconomic assessment. Um, so I, I would I would 
say that yes, that, that that's reasonable. Um, the the challenge does become on on how how we do value those and actually put a, a metric on it, um, and then then we do end up making those those decisions based on things like the you know quality adjusted life years and the the impact on patients' lives and and they're important. Um, we just have to figure out how do we, we quantify it in a way that's going to be fair and equitable and within the and allow us to, to live within the resources that we have allocated. Okay, and a question for Paul. Your paper speaks to pharmaceutical innovation without really describing what you would define as being an innovative product. Before speaking to policy options that reward R&D or innovation, should we not better define what we consider to be innovative? Well, my definition of innovation, I guess perhaps implicit, was, if not explicit, <clears throat> well, it wasn't explicit then, it was implicit, is that uh, it has a, um, a meaningful impact on health outcome. That's the entire name of the game when it comes to drugs, is to you know improve the quality or the length of life. So that would be, if you can, if you can find a way of doing that through pharmaceuticals, that's or, you know, by changing the way that pharmaceuticals are used or by thinking of new drugs, that would be, to my mind, that would be count as pharmaceutical innovation. Okay. Um, another question for Bob. Um, statement. Orphan drugs are a real problem. The pricing we have seen on some drugs is hardly believable. We are seeing very different willingness from different provinces to pay for some of these drugs. But this is how we ensure innovation and availability. So there's an obvious need for coordination. What steps are the provinces taking to coordinate better? Hmm, good question. Um, in terms of specific things that we're doing, uh, we do have uh, uh, we are working together on a, a national framework for the, uh, how we evaluate these these uh, these rare drugs. Um, so we are cooperating amongst the provinces on on. Uh, uh, in this area, uh, the lead is is through Ontario, so we're we're happy to do that. Um, the uh, discussions on these these particular drugs did start largely with uh, the national pharmaceutical strategy, and within that strategy, uh, we had had uh, uh, a number of different possibilities that we, we talked about, uh, uh, including the you know adoption of, of uh, standards uh, across the country for how we deal with individual rare diseases. Um, those discussions uh, have not continued, um, so uh, we we were not pursuing that uh, with our, our federal colleagues as much as um, uh, individual jurisdictions. The challenge is, as I, I'm sure the the question asker has uh, is, is aware of, is that the, these rare diseases may not be. Uh, proportionate uh, to our population, so you can get a disproportionate number of folks with uh, a very rare and very expensive disease uh, living in a, in a small and poor province, um, which is, is very difficult. And uh, when you have some larger jurisdictions who have more resources or are better able to, to fund those therapies, uh, the concern is that uh, uh, there isn't equitable access uh, across the country and folks with those rare diseases end up having to look at relocating and, and going to where the, the funding is, uh, which makes it that much more pressure on those large jurisdictions. Okay. Uh, I don't know who this one's addressed to, so you might both want to comment or, or maybe one of you can clarify. At what point in the drug approval process is a price point set? Are the clinical trial costs largely predictable, allowing for a price to be set at the beginning of the clinical trial process? Could this give governments an idea of future cost and benefit? Well, I can, I can start. Maybe Paul can, can uh, supplement and at his perspective. Uh, the, the price is, is determined after notice of compliance is, is provided by Health Canada. So uh, we don't know the price until until they, the manufacturer actually submits to uh, the common drug review or to, to jurisdictions, puts their the product on the market. Um, and that there is a, a mechanism through the Patent Medicine Prices Review Board for determining whether that price is is uh, non-excessive uh, in their terms, but it, it's at a quite a late point. So it, we do typically do not know the price at the time that the clinical trial is is, has, is uh, being done. If that clinical trial is being used as a as part of the uh, dossier for uh, uh, market access to a country, if it's a clinical trial that that's you know after market access, and clearly we know the price, but uh, typically we, we we don't know that. 
Okay. Well, I could add by saying that the, <clears throat> I mean, first of all, it's hard to define the price because there's many prices that are, there's many effective prices paid by different pay payers. I mean, there could be a high nominal price <clears throat> and then the price that's actually charged to a, let's say, a large public drug plan in Canada might be much lower um, by virtue of the workings of the secret rebates. Um, but typically, the uh, <clears throat> the price is set, set such that the cost per quality adjusted life year is uh, within some threshold or close to some threshold. Okay, another question. Uh, is it not more appropriate to speak of a range by therapeutic class when looking at the cost of drug development? Speaking about an average is potentially misleading. Costs vary by disease state and by complexity. Uh, your, your thoughts on that? That makes sense to me. Oh, sure. I mean, uh, the figures I was quoting earlier uh, speak to... Um, well, I guess that's a problem in literature, isn't it? I mean, we don't really... If you look at the Demasi numbers, you're not quite sure what that number means in terms of specific therapy. Are we talking about a lot extension, or are we talking about, um, you know, a completely novel therapy, first-in-class therapy? So it's, I think it would be... Um, my understanding would be that 1.8 bill refers to um, a first-in-class targeting unprecedented mechanism of mechanisms of action as opposed to uh, a drug that's um, capitalizing on a known um, and, and uh, therapeutically validated, clinically validated uh, mechanism of action. I didn't know that, Paul. I thought that was, uh, that was being put out as an, as an average cost. I actually don't know myself. It's hard to know exactly what the, the democracy number refers to. I think if you um, speak to different people, uh, you get different answers. I, I don't think that it refers to... Well, that might explain some of the discrepancies that I've heard, because I've heard numbers as low as $40 million for you know, a drug to be developed, and you think, well, there's an awful lot of discrepancy between $40 million and yeah. $40 million. Well, the $40 million doesn't include the preclinical costs. I mean, this, this whole literature is so... Uh, well, it's worthy a different phone call, perhaps, but it's um, it's it, for a for a novel for a drug that's targeting a novel <laughs> um, therapeutic target. I can assure you that it's more than forty million dollars. I mean, I have I just been in this industry or working in this area too too long to know it's more than forty mil. Maybe forty mil includes things like um, supplementary drug submissions where you're changing the dosing a little bit or you're doing uh, some tweaks to the uh, to the monograph, but. Mm -hmm. um, no, it's more than $40 million. Yeah. And at the end of the day, I guess, we look at what the puts and takes are um, in the marketplace and, and how manufacturers are, are doing in terms of their, their profitability and their ability to, to cope in you know, today's very challenging marketplace. So, you know, they charge what, what they need to charge and pay, payers pay what we're able to pay and, and at the end of it, if they're, they're able to, to keep a vibrant industry going, then that's great. Um, and if not, then we have to figure out how, to, how do we keep it going. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Um, now, we're almost out of time, and I, I want to combine these last two questions, which are kind of on a related and slightly different topic, so I'd like to get them both in before we uh, switch off. So to both preventers, the first question, uh, you haven't directly addressed the industrial policy aspect, which is especially present in Quebec. In particular, Bob asserted that the ultimate goal here is to improve health outcomes. Arguably, this is not exactly actually the case, and we face potentially conflicting objectives. So how do we ensure that A, we pay a fair price, and at the same time, B, Canada and each province get their fair share of innovation in R&D, which is an, is an objective in and of itself. The question relates to competition between jurisdictions to, attack, to attract R&D. And the other question, which is similar and again addressed to both of you, at a time when Canada is trying to compete for the next generation of economic growth in the innovation economy, can we incentivize companies to grow and keep their R&D here for the benefit of, our, of Canada, while also noting that we have an IP, international proper, intellectual property regime, and don't have an orphan drug policy that is out of line with the rest of the developed world? Do you want us to answer this in 30 seconds? I do. <laughs> <laughs> well, we can't do that. But I guess one of the things that I, I think of is that that was very complex and very broad-reaching, and and uh, we do need to think about you know, what our capacity is within Canada, and to you know maybe it's going to be to focus on a therapeutic target rather than trying to to be across all of them. 
So I'll just throw that out as a last thought. Well, my perspective on this is that there's um, there's different ways that in which you can attract <clears throat> R&D investment into your jurisdiction. You can um, have a bidding war, which is what I think uh, is being proposed by some quarters. That you know, we if we don't, uh, the implicit threat is if we don't um, add this and this IP protection, that all the money will go to Europe, the U.S. or Europe. And we can certainly play that game if we so desire. We can also consider strategies which which actually make it desirable on purely economic terms, not on a game theoretic term, but on a purely uh, financial terms for companies to invest in Canada. And um, industry will do that. I mean, for instance, they have recently um, moved, I know Pfizer has moved their their antibiotics research um, team from Connecticut to China, and China isn't known for their strong IP. So industry will, in principle, actually move uh, there are indeed two places which actually offer fundamental, you know, economic uh, incentives to do it, not just based on game uh, strategic incentives. Mm -hmm. um, but, and I think that the proposal that um, I alluded to in the last slide, this idea of having these collaborative models, which would capitalize on the um, the strengths of the local um, academic community and the local pharma community um, would actually fit the bill. It would actually make it attractive for a company to invest in a, in a, in a region irrespective of their IP regime. Okay, thank you both. This has been an excellent, se excellent session. And we hope you will join us again for our next session on April 28th at 1 o'clock Eastern Time when we discuss physician payment mechanisms for Canada. More information and registration details are available on our website, www.chsrf.ca slash researcher on call. But before you hang up, we would greatly appreciate your participation in a brief survey about today's researcher on call. Once you exit the webinar, an electronic survey will launch automatically, and a follow-up email with links to the survey will be sent within the next 24 hours. Most importantly, I'd like to extend a sincere thank you to our speakers, Paul and Bob for such an engaging presentation and discussion today. Also, we thank you, our audience, for your participation and excellent questions posed today. That concludes today's Researcher on Call. Thank you again for joining us. For CHSRF, I'm Jillian Mulvale.